Imagine taking a conterminous map of the United States and drawing a line across it, from Eureka, California to New York City. Let this line represent the history of the Earth. It would start, as all good things do, at the creation of the Earth, some 4.5 billion years ago. Moving eastwards, the formation of the Moon would be the next major stop around 50 million years later. 100 million years after that, liquid water would form for the first time on Earth's surface, the temperature having cooled sufficiently to allow it to collect. As we continue on our travels, there is not much more to report of any special interest for some time. However, at the 3.45 billion year mark, we get fossilised evidence for the existence of early prokaryotic life. Life may have existed before this point in time, but we can say with some confidence that it was around by at least now. This is rapidly followed up by the emergence of photosynthesis as a way for the first simple life forms to gain energy from the sun, freeing them up from dependence on chemical energy from geothermal vents. Later versions of photosynthesis will release oxygen as a byproduct, essentially terraforming Earth and oxygenating the atmosphere by the 2.3 billion year mark. The first eukaryotic life appears around 2 billion years ago, not far out on a timeline from the Great Lakes. Eukaryotes are different in having their genetic material consolidated into a single nucleus. At 1.3 billion years we get the first land fungi, and then something dear to many of our hearts, the first sexual reproduction. Individual life forms start mixing their genetic information when bringing into existence the next generation. As we near the Appalachian Mountains at around 600 million years ago, we get the coincidence of two things. The first multicellular life on Earth, and the development of the ozone layer, a shield of molecules that protects the Earth's surface from damaging ultraviolet radiation. At 541 million years we get the Cambrian Explosion, a massive expansion of biodiversity. Many kinds of life forms that are familiar to us today emerge at this time, including fish, crustaceans and land plants. We also get a variety of global mass extinction events appearing in the geological record, such as the late Devonian mass extinction at 372 million years ago. Life survives and rebounds though. At around 250 million years ago we get the first dinosaurs. Mammals appear sometime after that, as do birds and pine trees. At the 66 million year mark, a famous meteor plunges through the atmosphere, causing an impact that not only wipes out the dinosaurs, but 75% of all plant and animal species living in the world. As we near the end of what can be shown at this level of magnification, in the state of New Jersey, we see the emergence of the first apes, a genealogical superfamily of tailless primates at around 25 million years ago. To see where humans fit into this picture, we'll need to take a much closer view. Crossing the upper bay in New York City, we find that the Grand Canyon and mammoths appear around the 5 million year mark, followed up by the arrival of Australopithecus at around 4.2 million years ago. Evidence of the first use of stone tools can be found 1 million years later, which is prior to the emergence of the first members of the Homo genus, which came into existence about 2 million years ago. Controlled use of fire follows not long after, as evidenced by the existence of clusters of scorched animal bones at prehistoric habitation sites. By the eastern edge of the island we see Neanderthals, some 315,000 years ago, and then anatomically modern humans at the quarter of a million year mark. Human groups that migrated outside of Africa into other parts of the world did not always survive. However, we are able to permanently reach Australia, Europe and North America between 65 and 33,000 years ago. The domestication of our best friend happened around the 25,000 year mark, and preceded the beginning of human agricultural practices, themselves coinciding with the warming of the earth and the end of the most recent ice age, some 12,000 years ago. From there comes the metallurgical working of bronze and iron to fashion more durable tools and weapons, and the formulation of key religious ideas that would come to dominate the spiritual thinking of most people in modern history. Then, in a relatively short space of time, we see a cascading set of breakthroughs, including the invention of the printing press, understanding a physical place in the universe, and the development of the scientific method. This is where you now find yourself, at the leading edge of an incredible story of evolutionary innovation and struggle.
For most of Earth's history, life has come as an enormous struggle steeped red in tooth and claw, and more than 99% of all species have not made it through to be here with us now. For humans it actually came very very close at one point, with genetic research indicating that our numbers got down to just a few thousand individuals around 70,000 years ago before recovering. Essentially, we stared ominously into the abyss, and barely avoided falling in. Other hominids were not so lucky. Neanderthals, for example, once walked upon the surface of this world, created tools and art, wore clothing and jewellery, and buried their dead just as we do. Now, like so many others, they are no more. Nowadays, most of us live in dramatically improved conditions. We have ready access to clean drinking water, antibiotics, sanitation and public education. On average, we live longer today than we ever have before. If we don't want to feel the cold, we can press a button. If we're hungry, there are foods preserved in a box. If we graze our knee or get toothache, the chances of dying from it are a distant thought. By the lights of everything that has gone before, our lives now are an evolutionary anomaly, a single exception to a multi-billion year norm. Unfortunately, new problems have emerged to fill the void, and if we are to travel with confidence much further into the future, it seems to me that significant changes are needed at almost every level, from how we think and feel about ourselves and others, to how we act and organise society. Let me illustrate with a single example. We increasingly live our lives not in physical spaces, but in digital ones, and the rise of social media has helped turn criticism into one of the foremost elements of online culture. Unfortunately, the approach to criticism so often taken fills it with layers of hostility. Instead of attempting to understand other people and persuade them to a different point of view, we seek to punish them for their mistakes and deter onlookers from following the same course by injecting great volumes of scorn, rebuke and contempt. The reasons are undoubtedly many. Among them, it can be emotionally satisfying to see people we perceive as causing harm to the world punished, and the likes and praise we receive for doing this can certainly fill us with the warmth of acceptance and validation. It's also very easy not to connect with the humanity of other people from behind a screen, or to place ourselves in their shoes and look at the world as they do. Recent research indicates something really interesting here though, and that's that part of the explanation relates to scepticism that being empathetic towards people we disagree with is a useful thing to do. In a recent study, researchers gave people information to suggest that empathy was either useful or not useful when talking to others who hold opposing views about a matter of deep contention. Those who had learned that empathy was useful were not only rated by those on the other side as more likeable and empathetic, they were found to offer more persuasive arguments as well. The reason had to do with the fact that they adapted their communication style to something less needlessly oppositional and hostile, highlighting things such as the common ground between them or shared objectives. I think this issue of conversation, disagreement and persuasion is immense in the significance that it holds for our collective futures. All other things being equal, we should strive to criticise others in the same way that we would wish to be faulted, where our positions reversed. What this translates into will vary between people. But for most, I suspect it means not heaping scorn and ridicule upon others, or resorting to shame and hostility, or displaying enjoyment at other people's error and its prominence. Our goal shouldn't be to punish and coerce other people, but to make error in the process of correcting for it as pain-free as possible. After all, if we can succeed in lowering the social costs for others to change their views, we'd leave them that much freer to do exactly that. And to the extent that they do similarly for us, they leave us freer as well. I think there's an enormous amount to be said for being generous in how we think about other people and their different ways of thinking. We all live under conditions of deep ignorance. We don't know even one one hundredth of what we ideally should. We don't have the time needed to go and consider every issue fully through. At the end of the day, other people are just ourselves through other eyes. Ourselves if we've been born in a different latitude or longitude or a different time and place. And not only do we need other people to see what we presently do not, they need us likewise. Our cause is far from hopeless, we can be more than what we are, but I don't think we can leave it to luck alone, as all the warning signs are already there that great change is needed. If we squander this opportunity so rarely afforded to life, we will be throwing away a treasure that may never rise again. So here's to you, 
the extraordinary. Your life holds potential within it that cannot be found at any other time, and you are needed to help get us through. If you want a recommendation from me about where to begin, let me suggest that it can start with the very next thing you choose to do when you find yourself in a disagreement online, or where you place your likes as a reward for others when they engage in criticism. Choose wisely. I think we're worth it.